You are now in tune with a community on 318 Latino. Meet interesting people who make our community great. Hear their stories, check out their projects. Gracias. 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 Hello, my name is Bryant Garcia, and you are now watching with the community on 318 Latino. Today we have a great interview with the sheriff, Steve Prater from Caddo Parish. We hope you liked the interview. Please share, like, and comment, and we will see you right after the short messages from our sponsors. Thank you. There is a place where you can dare to dream, find lasting friendships, and a place to belong where you can find your calling and change the world one step at a time, where you can find yourself, where you can find your anchor. 318 Latino, por internet, desde Shreveport. So, sir, the purpose of this interview is to get to know you and the, to get to know the role of the sheriff to learn about the law enforcement and our prison system in the region. Welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here. And it's an honor to have you in our 318 Latino studios. My name is Brian Garcia. I am the owner of 318 Latino. This is a bicultural, bilingual blog and a multimedia digital uh, platform adapted to a new way of communicating to our Hispanic community. Our goal is to build bridges among our communities. I'd like to let you know a little bit about our Hispanic community here in the area. So, so far, uh, as far as research we've done, the oldest family that we have registered here, they, they came around the 1960s. In 2000, Latinos started booming here with the Air Force uh, through doctors, uh, teachers, and of course the GM plan had a lot of Latinos coming in as well. Then Katrina came in and they brought a bunch of Latinos uh, and a lot of diversity that fled from New Orleans and came here and established their roots here. Our community is very diverse, however. You know, not everybody's Mexican as many people would believe, but we have a lot of people from Honduras, Puerto Rico, Colombia, Mexico, Nicaragua. And out of those countries, their governments are very similar to ours. They are capitalistic in nature, but we also have people from Venezuela and Cuba, which, as we know, those countries are very different. That's how, that's how their system runs. Um, now, our workforce here in Shreveport is very, very diverse. We have people ranging from business owners and professionals, military, casino employees, and so much more. Our recent interview with, a, with uh, the Major Adrian Perkins, we did a little bit of research and we found out that uh, business owners, Latino business owner contributions have about $140 million per year in revenue. Now, they also bring in about $2,000 jobs to the area so that's a lot of a lot of you know movement for hispanics throughout the the shreveport area and that means we're growing quickly we're building strong roots in this region and we are building strong families here as well now along with the growth in this population and our workforce the latino the number of latino registered voters is also increasing which is why we're so thankful to have you here with us today so we appreciate your time we appreciate your effort to be here with us to educate us more about law enforcement in the region and i like to say we've heard so much good things about you we've heard so many great things about you and it is our goal to get to know you uh so tell us sheriff prater Tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us why you got interested in doing law enforcement. Yeah, I was, I was born in Tennessee and didn't move to this region, to Shreveport, until I was about eight years old, I guess. And uh, we moved here from from Tennessee through Texas. And, mm -hmm. and so kind of, I know the area well, but just started living in Shreveport, uh, like I say, when I went into the third grade. Uh, I didn't really have, I didn't grow up wanting to be in law enforcement. Mm. Uh, I didn't really know what I wanted to be. And, and so I ended up going and I was educated at, at North Highlands Elementary in Hamilton Terrace. And then I went to Northwood High School after one oh. year at Bird. And then I went to LSU. And my third year at LSU, I didn't, uh, I didn't really apply myself that well. And so my father uh, suggested that, that he wasn't going to help me with college anymore until I grew up. And so uh, I ended up getting on the Shreveport Police Department at age 21. And so I uh, spent 17, 
almost 18 years with the Shreveport Police Department working as a, a patrol officer and then a narcotics agent and a detective and did all of the typical things, worked my way up to sergeant. And once uh, I got to be sergeant uh, a number of years, then, then there was an opening for the chief of police's job. So I applied along with, I think, 42 other people. And somehow or another, I got fortunate enough to be selected. So I jumped from sergeant to chief of police in Shreveport. And I was chief of police for nine years uh, for Shreveport Police. And then uh, I, I retired and went to work, uh, ran for sheriff, and I've been the sheriff now for 20 years. Uh, I've run six elections and been elected each time. I've been really blessed in my career and blessed in my support. And, and uh, I think it's just uh, if you treat people fairly and, and if you treat them right, and you can still be stern when it comes to crime and law enforcement and holding people accountable, but you still, uh, if you treat people right, then, then you'll, you'll be good and you'll be blessed. Now, when I first heard the word sheriff, I immediately went back to the Western man in a cowboy hat being followed by deputies. And obviously, you know, in this day and age, that's not how it goes. So can you tell us more a little bit about the role of the sheriff? Uh, what is the extent of the responsibilities and the power of the sheriff? Well, the sheriff, really the term sheriff goes way back to the uh, Roman Empire and the, and the sheriffs, I believe is what they called them. But uh, the sheriff, that, that office has come down through the years but you're right the texas sheriff you think of that uh but louisiana the sheriff is it's a unique thing because louisiana is the only state that i'm aware of where the sheriff is the uh, tax collector mm. and the chief law enforcement officer of the parish or county mm -hmm. uh in in other in other counties the sheriff has to count on the police jury or the commission or something for their budgets mm -hmm. in louisiana not only do we collect taxes that's different but we also have our own taxing base uh, we have our own budgets mm -hmm. we don't have that's not approved by any board or commission like the city council or the cattle parish commission in other words i figure out what my budget is going to be i'm responsible for finding the revenue to do that Right. And uh, being the chief law enforcement officer in the parish, you really it's a constitutional uh, position, which is different. Also, mm -hmm. the, the sheriff really is the only law enforcement officer uh, that is uh, elected. Uh, for instance, chief of police is appointed. Right. The FBI director is appointed. Right. The FBI agents are appointed. The state police mm -hmm. commander is appointed, and the right. state police are appointed. But the people actually uh, actually elect the sheriff, mm -hmm. and can I answer directly to the people and no one else? Let me ask you: How long is each term as uh, sheriff, and what is the maximum amount of times that somebody can run? Uh, and also, as a citizen, what should we look for when we're voting for a sheriff? Well, when you Voting for a sheriff, you have to assure that, that the person is going to be fair uh, because the sheriff has a, a, a tremendous amount of, of, I hate using the word power, but the sheriff does have, being mm -hmm. the chief law enforcement officer, you really can, we can go into Shreveport and investigate anything we want. Mm -hmm. uh, we can, you know, we, we, we don't answer to the state police. We don't answer to the FBI. We don't answer to any, we're the chief law enforcement officer of the entire parish whether it be federal, state, or local, we, we're, we're the person. And so you have a lot of power. So when you're looking to vote on a sheriff, it's, it's so important that you find somebody that's, that, that treats his, his people well. Mm -hmm. And I, I brought over a unique uh, quality in the fact that I had worked under civil service mm -hmm. for so many years and as chief of police. So I knew how important it was to I let the deputies set up their own promotional system uh, which is unusual for any sheriff to do. Uh, there's no good old boy system at the at the Kettle Parish Sheriff's Office. Uh, they set up their own system. When we have to do a termination or mm -hmm. some kind of discipline, then I have a, a group of people that I go to and we discuss it and make sure that things are done properly so that so that there's no favoritism. And um, and so there's things like that. So I think the number one thing would be fairness. A fair person you'd need for mm -hmm. sheriff. You need a sheriff that has some experience in law enforcement. Which that's uh, very interesting that you have that internal uh, way of dealing with stuff internally. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Sorry. Right, and the uh, and and the sheriff has uh, 
like I say, they need law enforcement experience. There are sheriffs in in the in Louisiana mm-hmm. that uh, I think one of them that got elected this last time was a building contractor because mm-hmm. uh, you don't have to have law enforcement to run for sheriff. Mm-hmm. To, to be a judge, you have to be a lawyer, mm-hmm. uh, you know, that sort of thing. But to be a sheriff, there's no law enforcement that's required by the state of Louisiana, which I think is – I think that should should change. Uh, but in the case of Cattle Parish and me, you know, I had plenty of law enforcement experience, and I think that's important when you choose somebody, uh, somebody that's going to listen to the people, be accessible. Uh, so many people in Caddo Parish have my cell phone number. I'm, I am accessible for sure. I work in, on the clock 24 hours a day, and uh, people know that, and they're used to seeing me at crime scenes and big events. And, and so I'm there. That's the kind of thing that you need to look for when you're going to hire or elect a sheriff. Yes, sir. And again, we are very thankful. Now, we, we do live in a very diverse community here in Shreveport. It's, it's actually getting a little more diverse uh, as the time goes by. Uh, do you have officers in your in your uh, sheriff's office that speak Spanish uh, that are bilingual? We have Haido that comes here and does a show with us now and then. Uh, and also, is there a specific protocol for uh, dealing, you know, with Spanish-speaking individuals when, uh, whenever your officers are not, you know, the ones that speak Spanish. Yes, sir. That protocol is to to send out a lifeline. I guess, like if it was on that game show, you, we're gonna figure out. You know, we're gonna figure out someone that can communicate. The person is gonna be treated fairly, and like I say, fair is a big word to me. They're gonna be treated compassionately and kindly until we can find somebody that can communicate. Uh, that may know Spanish or know enough of it to to get us by until we can find the appropriate person. It's kind of like uh, the same thing that we would do with an individual that's deaf. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know that, that we have we have a means to where we can communicate with them enough until we can get the proper person to to come down and and they can do a better job of communicating than just the run of the mill deputy could. Excellent, and I'm I'm happy that we can you know find ways to come to understanding, especially with the people that just are just coming in here. Maybe some, they don't know the rules; they might have gone the wrong way down an intersection or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know that that can always lead to something a lot more uh, that can get escalated real quickly when the person doesn't know the language. So we're we're happy that we have those protocols in place. Yes. Uh, now, sir, our research shows you know that for some reason. Uh, Throughout Shreveport and through Caddo, you know, our office, our police, you know, law enforcement offices are understaffed uh, to some degree, you know, and there are, um, you know, there's there's not that many candidates that are good enough for the job that want to do it for the price that uh, it's being offered. So uh, I believe everybody in, in our, you know, 318 Latino community and, of course, in the law enforcement offices believe that defunding the police is just completely ridiculous. Mm. Uh, I, I believe so. I don't think it's the right thing to do. Uh, however, we do need to find ways to um, help our officers, our men in blue, you know, get that training they need, that, that you know, the qualifications that they need to better help our community. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Because we saw that there was a recent bill that was trying to be passed, and you know something happened there. Well, the d- defunding the police is a ridiculous idea. Yeah, this is a day and age when we need to be putting more funds in the police. If, if in fact you want a professional and well trained police department or a sheriff's office, you've got to pour money into training, and you got to pour money into. Uh, evaluating candidates and and into psychologicals and into that sort of thing to get the right people. But you also have to pour some more money into what we're going to pay people. Right. Uh, That it's ridiculously low for what's expected uh, of, of people in law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Uh, The starting salary around here is let's say $35,000. Well, you can't expect to not that that's, that's a livable wage, but it's not, it's not, it's not when you consider the mm-hmm. qualifications that you're demanding. Right. Uh, we have a 10-step hiring process mm-hmm. for the Cattle Parish Sheriff's Office, everything from physicals to psychologicals to polygraphs to backgrounds and the whole gamut. And by the time you pass all of that, then uh then you 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 you're quite a you're quite a candidate to be hired just about anywhere that you might want to go 
And so it's to, to come to, I'm always appreciative of people that will come to work in local law enforcement mm-hmm. because of, of the low pay and the high requirements. But we've got to do something mm-hmm. about that. Yeah, uh, I, I was talking to another officer. Uh, I believe he, he was a, a uh, in the sheriff's office as well. I don't remember exactly, but, you know, he said it, it's a calling. You know, for you mm-hmm. to want to do this, it's got to be a calling you want to have. But still, man, the, the calling, I, I believe there should be, you know, more than just the calling. You should be able to uh be worth or be valued you know monetarily for the service that you are providing to the community so that's that's my take on that yes sir that's it's it's so important that the community that's why i, I appreciate these companies that come up and will have cookouts mm-hmm. uh for everybody on shift and people that will stop deputies and stop police officers and tell them we appreciate you mm-hmm. for your service because you're right if you're going to be a good policeman a good sheriff's deputy, then you are going to be answering a call that you had. Mm -hmm. And to answer that call, if we can't pay you enough money to show you we appreciate you, which we can't, then people, by their mere attention and by their mere appreciation, that shows them and that that Mm -hmm. answers the whatever's inside them that the reason they came to that job was to help people and Mm -hmm. you're saying I'm helping you, so I'm I'm okay with that. I'll work for $35,000. Yes, sir. Uh, the, the, I believe the bigger issue we've been seeing is that you know some some of these uh, candidates that have gone through the through the training and all that, they end up going elsewhere where the pay is better. So we want to be able to keep those good candidates here. Yes, sir. That's yes, exactly sir. right. Yes, sir. So uh, right now we're about to go to a quick break. We'll be right back. If people have any questions, we'll answer them here. Thank you so much for being with us. We'll be right back. Sure. 318 Latino por internet desde Shreveport. Kingston Neighborhood Market is rocking with their amazing tacos and deli department. If you don't feel like cooking today, come see us at 5604 Benton Road. Kingston's Neighborhood Market, keeping you close to home. El Compadre Mexican Restaurant would like to thank the community for your love and support. We are here ready to continue serving with the best we can cook for you. El Compadre Mexican Restaurant, 502 East Kings Highway in Shreveport. This is Shreveport, 318 Latino. All right, and we're back on 318 Latino. Thank you, Sheriff Steve Prater, for being here with us today again. Uh, Let's see here. Well, in working with the media, working with the media every day, we get information about, you know, murders, we get drug busts, we get uh, sex trafficking, and this is continuously coming in Shreveport. Uh, It seems... It seems like there's an increment in in crime lately. I'm not sure. It could be a lot of, you know, there's more talk about it. Uh, You know, I'm sure this happens to a certain degree. Uh, My question is, have you seen in your six terms, if you in your six terms, I'm sorry, of being a sheriff, an increase in crime? Uh, And if so, uh, what's being done to prevent crime uh, rather than respond to it? Uh, and what are the challenges that our city is facing and our and our parish is facing uh, to to make it safer? Well, for one thing, the um, the crime crime is cyclical. Mm-hmm. Crime is going to go up. Crime is going to come down. And there's no no one has discovered a magic or silver bullet that's going to do solve all the crime and 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 keep people from doing bad things. Right. I think ever since the Ever since Adam and Eve ate the apple, it's going. We're going to have crime, and so that's going to be with us. There's a lot of things that we can do about crime, and uh, a lot of it has to do with law enforcement. A lot of it also has to do with the community and their willingness to put up with crime and their mm-hmm. willingness to come forward and let us know about crime. Mm-hmm. The city of Shreveport right now is having a violent crime problem, mm-hmm. um, but they there again there has been like I say cyclical times in the past where it's been violent. You do hear about crime more day more these days because of the pl- proliferation of media mm-hmm. uh, whether it be social media or the uh, paid or or whatever you know the other kinds of media the the paper and the uh, and news stations and right. radio the other typical media so you hear more about it now but the truth of the matter is that that there is a we're having a blip right now mm-hmm. in in Shreveport Caddo Parish I'm proud to say uh, Caddo Parish has come down its crime rate has come down both violent and property crimes uh, every year for the last 19 years. 
Uh, it's been steadily decreasing for 19 years. I'm so proud of that. It's, uh, the FBI recently released some statistics, and Caddo Parish's crime rate was lower than Bossier Parish, Bossier City, or Shreveport. Uh, and so I was, I was real proud of what we're able to do there. And when I say we, I'm not just taking all the credit for it, because if you're law enforcement and you take credit for when crime is down, mm -hmm. then you have to take credit for when crime goes up. Absolutely. And there's a lot more to it than just law enforcement. But law enforcement, visibility, aggressiveness of, of putting up with not only you've got to address not only large crimes but small crimes mm -hmm. and give people a sense of peace in the community. And I think that's very important. And, and so do I. I really think that we do need to to – you know, be more involved in this community as well, because you guys right. can do your part, but we got to do ours as well. Right. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, our next question, our next set of questions is, is going to go more towards the possession of guns to, to the okay. Second Amendment. So the Second Amendment of the, of the Constitution of the United States of America protects the right of Americans' people to own, bear arms, uh, and that law was made about 231 years ago. Um and that was, of course, a very, very different situation. You know, they had muskets and stuff back then. Today, we have high caliber and stuff like that. Um, today, the recession and the unemployment uh, has, I guess, contributed to buying more guns. I think specifically this year with COVID, there was an increase of people buying guns. Uh, now, I guess this this would be like a type of chicken and the egg question. Uh, does does violence increase the purchase of guns, or does you know more guns equal more violent crime? No, I think that violence causes people to causes people to purchase more firearms. Mm -hmm. I think the our society is so split right now. Everybody's fussing, and right. everybody can't stand the other side, and so everybody wants to run out and have a gun just in case. Well, mm -hmm. they, just in case isn't going to happen, but if that makes you feel more comfortable, we have a right to purchase and have the right. gun. The problem is that the problem with what we have with violence is that violence, the way to address violence mm -hmm. is you must address the illegal possession of firearms. Mm -hmm. We have people out there that are being arrested daily that are felons in possession of a firearm, mm -hmm. which are forbidden to have a firearm. Mm -hmm. uh, they, we have people out there daily that are arrested that have a firearm while they have narcotics with them, and that mm -hmm. is forbidden to be. Those type, those are, that's where your violence comes in. Mm -hmm. It doesn't come in from some, fella in overalls going to the Walmart buying a, a case of bullets. Right. Okay, That's not, that may scare people. That mm -hmm. may – people may say, okay, uh, you know, that's, that's not where we have our violent crime. Our violent crime is when you have felons and you have people that are not supposed to have guns, have mm -hmm. stolen firearms, have guns, and while they got narcotics, they have guns when they're – uh, like I say, felons, and and that's where the that's where your crime comes in, your violent crime. Yes, sir. So I I've seen your ads on uh, tougher punishment for felons with firearms. I've seen them on Facebook yes. and I've seen them on TV yes. as well. Uh, and and uh, what what are these statistics of felons with firearms in the area? What how, are they reoffending? Uh, and really, what would be the solution that you're seeking? What exactly is the punishment that we're trying to well, it, seek for them? You, we've all seen movies. On television, and when it gets to the movie's got a criminal in it, and the criminal will say something like, "Hey, man, I can't be caught with a gun." Right here, you have the gun. Well, we don't have a society right now. We don't have an area where people are that scared of it. They need to be so scared of having a gun if they're a felon, mm. or if they shouldn't have a gun, they should be so scared that they will be held accountable for it that they will not be in close proximity to a gun. What, what is the current punishment for it? Uh, the current punishment is five years, mm -hmm. but you only have to serve 60% of that five years, and then you get a year off if you take some courses while you're in jail. So the truth of the matter is that that it, it knocks it down to where you're, it's just almost it's almost laughable, right. uh, the amount of time that's spent. And, and so that really that mm -hmm. bothers me. Uh, that that we don't take that as seriously as we should, and we continue to lighten up and loosen up on mm -hmm. the on how we hold people accountable that shouldn't have firearms, and that's where your violence comes in. Right. Um, I guess the counterpart to that that some people would say would be. Um, 
you know, some felonies can be nonviolent, right? You know, possession of drugs to a certain degrees, multiple DUIs to a certain degrees. And there are people who live in, dang in dangerous neighborhoods that would also like to be able to protect themselves, but I guess they lost that right uh, to own the farm when they committed certain, certain cases. Well, if you prove to me you can't follow the rules, mm -hmm. um, then, then, you know, and to to end up being a felon, mm -hmm. you have to have con done several, right. several things, several times before you ever get a felony on your record. Because most of the times you're, it's pled down, it's dropped, it's mm -hmm. dismissed, that sort of thing. But by the time you get to the threshold of where you're a felon, then you've already proven that you, there's this rule book. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows it. It's the natural laws, but it's also written in the state of Louisiana. There's a rule book and say, okay, well, I, I, I can't follow those rules, but mm -hmm. give me a gun. Right. And and I'll follow that rule. Well, how, we, look, if you're a felon, you know, until you until you've served your time, until your grace period is up to where you can get a firearm, whatever that might be, then then you have that's part of your penalty. Mm -hmm. That's just part of the punishment. Right. And so, um, you know, you know, that's just the way I feel about it. So right now, uh, you stated the per the current punishment. What is your proposal that it be so that they are scared enough to follow that? Well, at to least the point if, of the law, because the law says it's written. It says if you are a felon in possession of a firearm, you shall be sentenced to five years uh, without suspension of sentence, probation, or parole. But if you look at a different law, it says everybody that's sentenced gets immediately gets sixty percent off for good time, mm. or forty percent off for good time. You mm -hmm. only have to send sixty percent of your time, and so right there, you know, it's a contradiction. And right. then it says, okay, and if you'll take this, you know, if you'll be a, a good, go to class while you're in prison mm -hmm. a few days, then we'll give you another year off. And so, time you take sixty percent of two of five years, mm -hmm. and then a year off of that then you've really not served a lot of time because you've been in the local jail right. awaiting trial for and then you get credit for that time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it just like needs to take it, off those like I guess quote unquote write offs, right? To, right. If I mean it's it's called what I call truth and sentencing. If your house gets burglarized and the law says the person's going and the judge says, I'm gonna sentence you to two years in jail, mm -hmm. you're thinking he's gonna be in jail for two years. Mm -hmm. That isn't so. He's going to be two years less 60 percent, mm -hmm. okay, less time off for any courses he might take. So he's just going to be in there a matter of months. Mm -hmm. And people don't know that. It's not truth in sentencing because what you heard the judge say was two years in jail, mm -hmm. and that's not true. So there's, there's problems with the Department of Corrections with our sentencing guidelines in Louisiana that I think ought to be addressed. I I, I'm definitely going to look more into that because that's very interesting. I've heard of the two for one uh, at certain jails. Just look like at that. the just look at Justice Reinvestment Practitioners Guide yes. on the on the website of Department of Corrections. Yes, yeah, sir. I'll definitely make a note and I'll we'll look into that for sure. Yes. Uh, now uh, we we've seen a lot of special ops task forces come in to Shreveport. You know, I, I believe they recently got like a rapper that's been you know selling cocaine in the air for a long time, and we see a lot of these these uh, you know pop pop task forces where they come in, you know, look for a suspect, get them, and it's like an in and out type of thing. What, what's it going to take for you know the the local police department or the local uh, law enforcement agents to get that done? I'm so glad you asked that question because the DEA, the FBI Violent Crime Task Force, mm -hmm. the U.S. Marshals Violent Crime Task Force, the ones that go and apprehend many of these people, they are staffed by primarily locals. Mm. I have I have one, two, three, four, five, five deputy sheriffs that do nothing but work for these federal task forces. I have two that are on the FBI Violent Crime Task Force. Two, I believe, that are on the DEA task force. One that's on the U.S. Marshals task force. So Bossier Parish does the same. Bossier City does the same. Shreveport does the same. So what you've got is locals mm -hmm. that are actually working under the guidelines of the DEA right. or the FBI, and they're the ones that are pulling the load. Gotcha. And then when the news release comes out, it's the FBI Violent Crime Task Force. Mm -hmm. Also assisting was Cattle Parish Sheriff's mm -hmm. Office. And the truth of the matter is they could not operate without us. Right. We supply the manpower for the federal people to come in and do the task forces. That's not to say that they don't do a great job and we all get mm -hmm. along well, but people need to know that it is, it's driven by, we're the engine by which the train 
uh, is pulled. Yes, sir. Well, that's like you said, that's that's how the, the media looks at it, right? Or how yes, it's sir. presented. Uh, and I'm glad to be able to 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 uh, clear that out to people. Yes. Yes, sir. So uh, our, our next set of questioning is, is uh, it, it's hearsay for a lot of people. Our next set of questioning is, uh, you know, once we uh, mentioned that we were going to have an interview with Steve Prater, uh, the sheriff, a lot of good questions came in, a lot of speculation came in, and then a lot of people who uh, have been through the system and had something to say came in and everybody had their questions. Um, this next set of questions relates to our prison system, uh, and uh, some of them are about specifically CCC. Right. Okay, I can take so, it from there. Okay, <laughs> if you go, want. R- go right ahead. Okay, CCC is Caddo Correctional Center. Yes, sir. It uh, holds about 1,500 people. Mm-hmm. Uh, 1,500 inmates. The purpose of CCC is to hold inmates that while they're awaiting trial because mm-hmm. the state constitution says I'm not only the tax collector, not only chief law enforcement officer of the parish, but also keeper of the jail. So everybody that's arrested for a felony in Caddo Parish is within 48 hours transferred to, to my custody. Uh, by law, it has to be that. The Caddo Parish Commission has to pay a certain amount of money, $3.50 a day is what they pay for each of these. There's roughly 900 out there right now. Mm -hmm. For each of these 900, Mm -hmm. they're paying $3.50 a day. Food for the place out there last year was $1.8 million. Uh, we have to buy un- we have to buy uniforms, pay for food, pay for cooks, pay for cleaning, pay for um, the the deputies that watch them, which is the most expensive. But where can you possibly go and stay for three dollars and fifty cents a day? And that's what we're reimbursed for everything we do, plus the guarding of them. Right. And so it's tremendous. It's a tremendous loss to our budget. We have to transfer every year between two and three million dollars from our general fund, which should be out there fighting crime. Even in Shreveport, we could be doing more in Shreveport. Mm -hmm. But we have to supplement the pay, supplement the the cost of CCC. I don't know where people ever got the idea that we are warehousing people for profit i would love to shut that place down we it is a money drain we make absolutely no profit out of it at all everything that we get there from from when we sell honey buns to the inmates or whatever we have to do plows right back into the existence of the facility uh, we have out of the 1500 spaces out there we have about 900 that we get three dollars and fifty cents a day for and we have about 200 that are state sentenced prisoners Mm -hmm. the 900 are unsentenced they've never been to trial the 200 we keep out there because we need to keep them out there because they're the only ones that we can cause that can work that we can let and they like they do things like they keep the grounds of ccc they do the laundry at ccc they do some of the cooking under the orders of the cook at ccc they help to maintain the building they go to the uh and they do they work at the food bank for instance we take crews out there they pick up litter all over the parish Mm -hmm. Uh, all of these they're workers and they volunteer to do this stuff it's not like that we force them to work the judge the judge sentenced them, and the judge said, you'll spend this much time at hard labor, mm-hmm. so we keep them at CCC, and then we say, hey, you want to get outside the facility? You can go pick up trash with the litter crew, and they said, man, we'll do anything to get out of here and just go get some fresh air. Right. So people have the – they have the, the completely wrong – we're not a prison. We're a jail, which is a huge – uh, a huge difference. We still have programs out there to try to make them better people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that, you know, we try to rehabilitate them. We have a reentry program that we run for the state. That was going to be uh, actually my next question is, you know, a lot of people uh, ha- have came to a certain conclusion that, uh, you know, most jails in their way are work somewhat as a placebo for society, you know, that they're not really in there to rehabilitate people, just to keep them away from the rest of society so that the rest of society keeps feels safer. Uh, so so how is it that uh, the programs that you have are helping 
them, uh, you know, rehabilitate, to, to reintegrate well, yeah. society. Okay, keep in mind now, we're not a prison. Right. We're a jail. We have 900 people out there, and we don't know if you're going to be there for 30 minutes mm-hmm. or if you're going to be there for 18 months awaiting trial. Yes, sir. So it's hard to start rehabilitation programs when you don't have – I mean, you don't have the a way to do that right. because of the the constant, you know, going to court and constant don't know how long they'll be there. So we can't. We offer a lot of programs, and they're they're able to take them, and we do what we can. But our responsibility is not rehabilitation. Our responsibility is to hold them until they go to court, and once they're sentenced, then they can go somewhere else to a a prison, a right. state prison, where the rehabilitation should take part. Right. So everything that we do in the way of trying to help and rehabilitate the prisoners at CCC is just land yap. It's things that we choose to do mm-hmm. to, because we feel like it's the right thing to do. We don't That's have right. to do anything out there, but just we could just lock them up and keep them and take them to court when it's time, but that's not the way we handle things. We have probably 20 different programs out there from getting your GED or your high school Mm-hmm. High set, I think is what they call it now. Your call, your high school education. We we do that out there. We have parenting. We have anger management classes. We have uh, AA, um, you know, regular AA. Yes, and and you're sub, you're able to get into any of these that you want to. That, that's, it, I'm I'm happy to hear that because, like I said, there's there's a lot of questions and a lot of stuff. And you know, we looked a little bit into it, uh, and we didn't find any evidence of that being the Look, fact please but i much there. rather wanted to ask you specifically so you can get these questions for the people i would love for anybody to come out there and bring as big a microscope as you want and i will open <laughs> every book we have out there to you and say please because the people that are out there saying we're warehousing prisoners or making money off mm-hmm. of prisoners or things those are people that have been in prison mm-hmm. and they nobody wants to be there right but we didn't. We didn't make a single one of them be there. Right. It's the judge. the The SPD will arrest somebody for burglary on Looney Street. Mm-hmm. They'll bring them to us, and the judge says you will keep them unless they pay this bond. And then if they go to court and found guilty, the judge says you will keep them for eighteen months. So it's all. It's never us. We don't determine who's there. Right. We don't determine how long they got to stay. It's the judge. <laughs> That that's probably the best way we we could ask that question, just because it's it's a little. Like I said to, pe- people just wanted to be rough with it. You're uh, right. They. Yeah. Yes, sir. They. Uh, now, the, for Hispanics, for the Latinos that are coming in uh, through CCC, I I do want to ask about you know what is the process that they have to undergo because I know a lot of them get flagged for immigration, so. Uh, if they do get flagged, you know what would be the process there, and where, where where are these immigration centers that they would have to go to? Ooh, you're you're getting into. A, I should know more about that than mm-hmm. I know about the immigration centers and where they have to go to. But there's very few that we hold for immigration unless mm-hmm. there's unless there's some kind of crime that they've committed. We don't right. we don't. It, us investigating immigration status because mm-hmm. we don't have the means to do that. Mm-hmm. And we don't have the authority to do that either in right. my way of looking. Uh, that's no different than me investigating income tax. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's a federal offense. That is not a local offense. It's right. not a state offense. And so, therefore, whether a person is, has a legal status to be here or not is not for us to determine. Mm-hmm. And so we we don't we don't get into that. Now, if we're told if there's a person that is, uh, say we run a, say someone has committed a homicide and we put them in the computer and mm-hmm. they flag that the immigration wants them also or mm-hmm. something and and ask them to hold a, you know, then we will do that because it's another law enforcement agency right. asking us. But we don't reach out and say, hey, you want this guy? Right. Or, hey, we got these two Hispanics and we'd like you to check them and see if you want them or not. We, we don't we don't have time to do that, you know, and that's outside our purview. And, and I think that helps clear out a lot of the air between a lot of Hispanics and law enforcement that are in here, man, just because, you know, a lot of them are, are – are, 
just anxious, you know, under the political times that we are, they, they just feel anxious about it. So that's good to hear and that. And there, there was a time a few years back, and I helped to clear this up, mm -hmm. and there was a time when people were being charged with driving. Without a driver's license? Driving without uh, proof of being a, a citizen or something mm -hmm. like that. And, and this was several years. In fact, Charles Scott was the district attorney at the mm -hmm. time. And we worked with him, and, and it was really, it's a, I think it was an unconstitutional state law that they were charging them with, and other agencies, mm -hmm. because, like I say, we have to hold them all, all the prisoners. But we, we, we cleared that out because that was just, uh, um, you know, that was the wrong way to do. That's not our, that's mm -hmm. not our business. And we certainly appreciate that. Now, Mr. Chief Prater, before, uh, you know, we, we finish, uh, I want to remind, uh, I want to thank you for allowing us to have Haido in the show. Uh, he he sure. comes in and he, he clears out a lot of information for us. He, he helps us, you know, uh, I, I believe he's helped a lot of Hispanics uh, who are victims of crimes uh, to come forward and, you know, be able to be a part of the process of, you know, getting these things dealt with. Because that's another big, big part of it is, you know, if you're scared of it, you might not want to actually go into uh, talk to law enforcement just because you're scared of it. But having Heido here definitely has helped a lot of people, and, and we really, really appreciate Good. that. Good. Yeah. Um, how can we as citizens, how can we as Hispanics, how can we as residents of Cattle Parish help you do your job better? Just, uh, just... For every person that speaks broken English, okay, that that would come up to a deputy and somehow convey to them they appreciate it. That's gonna that's going to bring not only us closer to citizens, but us closer to Hispanic citizens too. And to realize that that just because somebody speaks a little bit different language or looks a little bit different than you doesn't mean you have to uh, stand off from them or fear them or anything. I mean, you know, you gotta, we, we gotta, we gotta start, we gotta start truly acting like we love each other, that we care for each other. And, and sometimes when you put this uniform on and you walk out down the street, you don't know who likes you or who doesn't. And I know we're supposed to act like everybody likes us and be, be officer friendly and, and all of this stuff, but it's hard. You get kind of conditioned to where, you know, you just get kind of neutral with it. And, and sometimes it's best if somebody else will reach out to them. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I encourage. Uh, I encourage everybody to do is reach out to them and just get to know us. Uh, and accept us, and who knows, they may want to give you a big old hug or something, and, and you, you know, once you break the ice. And yes, so sir. I think that's one of the best things that, that the folks in the Hispanic community, because it, it's just common, it's just common nature. We just get, we just get scared of something we're not familiar with. For, and I don't know why, but fear, that's just the way we're known. Fear of the unknown, I think is what it is. Yes, sir. But, uh, it's great. And I'm happy that we can come through and we can uh, pull away from from our speculations, pull away from, uh, you know, just the fear of the unknown and come together as a community. And I'm happy that you're inviting us to do that as well. Sure. Sure. So, Anything we can do or if, if you hear of a complaint about any any way that we might have treated someone that, that speaks Spanish or Hispanic or or. Uh, I better not name too much because I'll say something politically wrong, but from any country or anything else, please call me directly. Call my office, and we'll work this out because most of the time it's going to be a deputy doing something he didn't realize or she didn't realize was done the wrong way or that was offensive or that could have been done better, yes, and we can correct it. And if it's ever anything else, I'll deal with that. Yes, sir. Now, before we do go, there's plenty of Hispanics uh, that are second generation that are coming into the area that know Spanish, that know English, that are starting to go to university, college, and stuff like that. And they're looking just like you did when you were 21 years old, what to do with their lives. Um, I hear that Cattle Parish is currently uh, looking for for uh, deputies, looking for, uh, you know, people to come in to, do, to feel that calling. Uh, how can those guys... Uh, you know, get in contact with you. Oh, just call the call the Cattle Parish Sheriff's Office, and we have a personnel division. We have mm -hmm. just call my office and and uh, Ada, the the lady that my confidential secretary or 
whatever you're supposed to call them she's uh she kind of runs the sheriff's office sometimes and <laughs> and uh, just call her call anyone with the sheriff's office and we'll point you in the right direction because we do need we're about 50 deputies short uh and and so we could use and and we would love to get more uh spanish speaking deputies that would be great excellent and thank you so much again for being here yes sir any last words you'd like to say to the latino community not a thing thanks all right well thank you so much sir esto ha sido or this has been uh with the community on 318 latino and we'll see you again next time 318 Latino por internet desde Shreveport.